and uh, have also today invited a Buddhist philosopher here, because uh, yesterday there were discussions on uh, on uh, uh, how to find what is true, epistemology, evidences, and so on, which are uh, those from a non-European uh, uh, background. You'll find it strange uh, because it is there in uh, a lot of not only the Buddhist texts but also in the different uh, so-called Hindu traditions, six traditions of Hinduism, so also they are in the Charvaks and the Jains. So it's a rich tapestry of search. So I'm going to <coughs> talk about uh, the shift to Asia and why we must uh, think, uh, rethink Eurocentrism in philosophy, social sciences, science and history. I'm not going to talk about social sciences. If you want to have uh, publications on this, uh, internationally published, in, uh, and uh, if you, uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll put a link to my uh, publications uh, in your website. And uh, I'm also very glad uh, that for, in contrast to India, in contrast to, say, Singapore, in contrast to beginning with parts of China today, in Sri Lanka, there has been no serious attempt at history of science, apart from aspects of Buddhist thought. I have attempted three times. Uh, once for 20 years ago, when I was general president of SLAS, once at the National Science Foundation with a three-day uh, workshop on history of science, and now through the Royal Asiatic Society, we are trying to look at the history of science in Sri Lanka. There's hardly any, and so you are in a potentially vacuum where you can contribute. So we welcome you to contribute that vacuum. And my uh, purpose is today uh, basically an introduction. Now, I, I want to, for you to go back 300 years, maybe 200 years, and then you will notice that the dominant powers in the world uh, were in Asia at that time. It was in India, it was in, okay. Uh, India was not one entity, but the sub -base, subcontinental region, apart from Sri Lanka, which was under Portuguese barbarians at the time, uh, 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 China, uh, Japan, and so on. Thereafter, the West, as we all know, became dominant. And today, a process in the, is underway whereby Asia will once again be the dominant player in the world. I believe it's rightful place. And this will have deep repercussions in academia, in what is taught in 20 years' time in halls like this, culture and knowledge. Now, I want to go back to a study which some of you have, would have known, 2004, uh, the BRICS study by Gold, uh, Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs, as you know, is an investment firm. And it projected growth rates of different countries and said that the so-called BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, uh, will exceed those of the uh, G6 countries, US, Japan, Italy, France, Germany, and the UK by 2039. And only the US and Japan may remain among the six largest in US dollar terms by 2050. China, and they said that China could be the largest economy by 2040. Now, there's a gentleman who had studied in China, so he must be heartened at it, or disheartened. I, I couldn't get uh, whether that was his mood. But now, Goldman Sachs, uh, Sachs did a subsequent study last year and revealed that not only the BRIC, but the next 11 economies will be the emerging global, uh, are emerging from the global financial crisis, whom all of you would have known occurred circa 2018, you know, Wall Street crash. Goldman Sachs itself had some problems. Uh, okay, Australia escaped because it was basically exported to China, and uh, that uh, uh, they feared the global economic crisis, uh, which engulfed both uh, uh, US as well as now exceedingly in Europe, much better than uh, the Western continents. Uh, uh, and it also said that uh, China could become as big as the US by 2027, which would be happy news for Australia, because Australia uh, supplies raw material to China. I think most uh, 
uh, things like uh, Rio Tinto, you know, of, uh, so on. So, but already in 2010, China became number two. This is in, those of you know, in uh, GDP terms. GDP terms means financial terms or economic terms. But actually, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, purchasing power, uh, probably uh, the situation is much better. And uh, of what you can buy, you know. And uh, for instance, if you go to parts of China, even the so-called backwards parts of China, like Kunming, you'll see uh, that it is like parts of uh, uh, US, you know, maybe not a good thing. But now the power to the people was the slogan in China, okay, not exactly. Now the question is power to which people? If you remember the head of state of uh, China visited uh, 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 the U.S. Uh, see, uh, U.S. Uh, I think last year, uh, and uh, uh, this was a cartoon in the U.S. on the state dinner. This is metaphorical that the state dinner was McDonald's, which actually, frankly, is not a good thing that you eat. I notice that all of us here are not McDonald's types, you know, we are fairly slim. And uh, it's been uh, served McDonald's and uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, what do you call these things, uh, uh, fried chips, which are, which, uh, French fries, which during the crisis uh, uh, the U.S. right wing, especially the theological right, said that they, are, they should be called some other fries, I think, you know. So anyway, uh, the, this shows that U.S. today is a declining power and that it owes a lot to China. In fact, it kept, it's kept by Chinese loans. You may have noticed in the Sri Lankan press a few weeks ago, people complaining that we are uh, borrowing from China. But we borrow from China is nothing compared to what the U.S. borrows from China. U.S. Kept, is kept afloat purely by China, largely. And if China puts a plug, U.S. will go down. Of course, China also will go down for other reasons. And uh, the European countries, which are in a mess now, have been making regular kowtowing, as you know, pilgrimages to Beijing, asking for a hand or some money. So, so that is the the prevailing situation, which is going to dramatically change, uh, uh, as, your, uh, as our Australian colleague knows, there are futurists like uh, Rick Slaughter, I think you remember his name, uh, who, uh, and he and I work together. We are talking about the decline of Europe and, uh, and the rise of Asia and what it would mean in the future. I'm not going to talk about the future. I'm going to talk about um, the rise of Asia and what it means for history of science, philosophy of science, knowledge, and so on. Now, the rise of China is according to co-Asian humanitarian values, which is a contrast to the barbaric rise of the West from the 15th to the 20th century. The West had engaged in widespread colonization, genocide, slavery, white supremacy, double talk, and Christian intolerance of peoples across the world in Asia, Africa, Australia, and America. If you recall, the previous pope, uh, I think about three or four years ago, apologized altogether about 110 times to crimes committed by his uh, peep, uh, by his instructions, his Buddhist instructions. But of course, he did not uh, uh, apologize to Sri Lanka. Then, I, and I think in Australia, you have apologized to the aborigines. And I noticed making great efforts to drag the aborigines out, although they have a bit of a drink problem. You know. I occasionally do uh, after about 8 o'clock in the evening. Uh, the, sh the shift to Asia is uh, occurring uh, amidst passive globalization in trade, production, science and technology, culture and fashion, etc. As Asia becomes home to these factors, they will increasingly become Asianized. Uh, we can talk at length on this. We have written extensively around these issues. Uh, this economic shock, uh, shift is occurring with a global redivision of labor uh, work. Uh, 